So when they get down to the last two or three words and everyone starts screaming and saying play ball and everything else, I'm like. But I think the thing that is lost in our country is the very thought that he mentions in there a heaven rescued land, the powers that be and revealing that God himself was the one that protected our country and preserved us a nation. Young people, there is a verse missing out of that song. There is a verse. It's a controversial verse. It is. Our society is right, trying to make fun of the Star Spangled Banner and claims that the Star Spangled Banner teaches slavery. And in the verse that is missing out of there, it does mention slaves but it's not talking about our country's slaves. He's talking about people that were enslaved and hired, hirelings and slaves. He's talking about those that were hired to come to our nation and then those that were enslaved and forced over here by England and Germany and other countries to come over here and kill us off to stop us from being a nation. They're not promoting slavery in our nation. That was never the original form of that song, but our society is trying to make it as if, well, the word slave is in there. And so he's talking about enslaving the, no, it's not what he's talking about. And so a lot of places are actually taking that verse out or criticizing the whole song. Well, the reason they really want to criticize the song is there is a goodness to it. When Christ is lifted up, when God is praised, the world reels, they hate it. So, I hope you enjoy your 4th of July. We are free right now. And I hope and pray that we remain that for years to come. We have some major freedoms that we've been given in this country. Five of them especially. Freedom of worship. Freedom of assembly. Freedom of the press freedom of speech, and don't, I'm forgetting the last one. Freedom of, well, we have the right to bear arms. Is that one of those five, though, that is listed in that primary categories? But there's a lot of, there's a lot of them mentioned, but there are five really, really major ones that they've pushed that, the government has no right restricting at all. And uh, the freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom to petition the government for a redress of grievances, freedom of freedom of speech, and that may be the last one that I was saying, freedom to petition the government. We have freedoms right now. We have freedoms right now. And we're losing them slowly. We are. They might not be taking away the whole freedom. What they're doing is they're taking your freedom. They're just whittling away at a little at a time until there's no more freedom. It's all for your safety and security though. It's, they, they want to, they love you and they want to protect you. And uh, I believe the men that wrote the constitution studied the Bible and knew and understood what they were dealing with. And when they wrote it, they said the constitution is for a Christian nation. They said that. A nation that is not a Christian nation cannot live by the Constitution, and therefore it will be null and void by a non-God-fearing people. Any questions tonight? Any questions tonight? I do have three or four. I need to catch up on some. Um, right now, I have the one I brought up about being contrary. I have one that was started on, someone asked about the Sabbath a while ago. We started that one, never finished that one. I have another one that came up about who are the seven spirits in the book of Revelation. And then another one I've been doing on the study of heaven, the one that based off of what we see and know and, and heaven. And there's another one I, I, I started, I get into studies and then I, I just get caught up in studying. And I love it. And uh, just this morning in my Bible reading, I fell asleep. Um, and I told my wife, I said, I know what I read, but I don't remember what I read. 
But I know this, I was taking notes while I was reading. And so as soon as I looked down at my piece of paper and I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, it just ca came back to mind. So I'm glad that I was actually, because I mean, it was, I don't know what time it was, but somehow quite a few chapters into it, I, I nodded off. But the, the things that I was writing down that really were getting my attention, I can actually go back to and refer back to. And uh, I love reading and studying and it gets exciting. So any questions tonight at all? Any questions? Yes, sir. So, he actually does start out in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, the words of the preacher. So, according to the scriptures and the very words that are there, I would say yes. Now, preacher is not always the same word of pastor. There's the difference. Because the Bible tells everybody to preach the gospel. To preach just means to proclaim. It doesn't have to be from a pulpit. It doesn't have to be to a large crowd. It has to be to speak with authority of the word of God, to proclaim God's word with his authority. That's where preaching comes in. Pastoring has a different effect. He was not a pastor. He was a king, but he was a preacher. He did preach. And obviously, the way you know he preached and shared the word of God is because he actually wrote a few books and declared it even in print. So here's where we as studying words, we have to be very cautious about getting so over detailed in them that we forget that some words have a little bit more of a fluidity in them. So like singing, the word sing, what does the word sing mean? To sing is actually the same thing as speaking, but with a fluid tone. You're, at, you're speaking, but you have a flow to it, a melody to it. So when the Bible says speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, is that saying, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved is that what it's saying, to speak it out? Well, to speak is the same thing as to sing, except to sing it has a melodious tone to it. So when he's saying speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, if you're speaking, you're speaking. But if you're singing, you are speaking with a melody. So there is a connection. So to preach, to pastor would be to be preaching, but includes a lot of other categories as well. But to preach just is to proclaim the word of God and share the word of God with his authority. So yes, according to this, he is a preacher, but not a pastor. Jeremiah now, if you look in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah will call himself a pastor. I mean, he will use that term as a pastor. He'll use the term pastor. Um, but... Solomon, you don't find him using that term pastor. You find the word preacher. So he was a proclaimer of the word of God and wrote it down as well. Um, verse number 12 as well. Let me see here. Verse, yeah. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 12. He gives both of his, um, his title of who he was. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and to search out wisdom, out by wisdom concerning the things that are done under heaven. And so, and then he goes on. So he was a king, but he was also a preacher. He proclaimed God's word. Unfortunately, we also know Solomon did not do everything he was supposed to do. And uh, we also know that Solomon would not have qualified to be a pastor. <laughs> we do know that. 700 wives, 300 concubines. That man was not qualified to be a pastor. <laughs> so, but he was a preacher. So... Any other questions? Any others? Well, I'm just going to get into this one and try to finish this one out tonight uh, about Christians. Should we be contrary? Contrary. Someone that is contrary is something that somebody that is opposing. 
Something that is opposing, okay? Opposing. I want to go, and I, I don't remember how far I got into it the last time, but let's go to the book of Judges. Let's go to the book of Judges. Chapter 2. I understand that children need to be children. I understand that. But we are not raising our children to stay children. So for a child to be a child doesn't mean that they are allowed to live childishly in every aspect of their life. And we as adults, or those that are parents, those that are teachers, have no authority over them to direct their childness childishness into learning adult tendencies and adult behaviors. My children, I don't teach them how to go, uh, or make baby noises. I don't teach them. I teach them how to speak clearly and precisely. They don't always. And there are times during the day, my ch children will say something. And as soon as it comes out of their mouth and I hear that they're not saying their L, they're saying a W. I want a wowie pop. A wowie pop. So I will work on them. Let's practice our L's. Why? Because I don't want them to always be childish in their speech. I want them to grow up. Judges chapter 2. Look at verse 18. It says, And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. So they were being oppressed. They cried out to God. God sent a judge. God was with the judge to deliver them. Verse 19. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers, and following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So first of all, before we go any further, I want to point out that these people had men of God in leadership positions to lead them, guide and direct and keep them from harm from the enemy, as well as add godliness in their examples. Now, what these men did as they were going through and, and judging is they literally were supposed to be judging by the word of God. As soon as the judge died off without proper authority, what happens? Children become more childish. I can go into a lot of examples of my own children and how... They do things. I can go into examples of myself in my own childhood. When my parents were not around, my parents were good parents. But when they were not around, I was childish. At the age of 11, 12, 13, I was still childish. Well, you were a teenager right then. I was childish. How many of you know children who are very good at playing tag. How many of you know children that are very good at playing tag in a house where the rule is you're not allowed to touch the floor? We jumped from couch to couch. We climbed over counters. We were climbing walls. I'm not exaggerating. I could use the door frame. When I was over there, I didn't even hear the conversation you were talking about. But this is where how my mind works. We went over to Blue Ridge Baptist to deliver some chairs, and out of my mouth, I did not know their conversation. I said, this building would be easy to climb. And as soon as I said it, the guys said, well, that's how they did. They were already talking about some guys that had climbed over their building, and they were already in a conversation. I didn't know they were talking about it. I told them, said, this building would be easy to climb. Get on this roof. They were already talking about someone that did. That's where we were climbers. As soon as mom and dad were out of the room, or out of the house, or wherever, we were childish. I was one of those kids that I could walk down a hallway, down the walls, without touching the floor. It was fun. It was childish. 
I never once saw my dad going through the house like that. He never taught me that. My dad never jumped from couch to couch to get through the living room. But I will say this, and my brothers and sisters can swear to it. My dad told us one day when he caught us. Kids, you keep jumping on my furniture when you get older and you get married. I'm coming to your house and I'm going to jump on your couch. You know what we did? We tried visualizing. This is going to be fun. We did. I'm t my brothers and I sat in a room once talking about what it would look like if dad jumped on our couch when we were adults. We thought it'd be funny. It's childish. When the authority, the biblical authority was gone, they went back to their old ways. There was no direction, no guidance. They went back to their old ways. Proverbs chapter one. Proverbs chapter one. What I'm, I'm pointing out, first of all, and we could go through the book of Judges. What I'm pointing out, first of all, is that we all physically, fleshly, our physical bodies, we have ways, okay? I'm going to point that out. We all have a way. There's nobody in this room that is perfect or sinless. There's nobody in this room that's perfect or sinless. We all have ways. Now, some of you have gotten older, you've learned from some others, and your ways have changed. But we all were born with a sin nature. And the children of Israel, without a leadership and without godliness in their lives, they were going to go their own way. So here's what I want you to think about. Were the children of Israel going the right way? Their way? Was it their way to go the right way when the judge was in place? Or were they actually living, here's the word, contrary to their own ways? Think about that. Contrary. The children of Israel were actually living in opposition to their own natural lifestyle. They were sinners, worshiping false gods, and they went according to the leadership of the judge while he was in office and only. But as soon as he was gone, they went back to their own ways. So obviously they were living contrary while the judge was in position. Proverbs 131. Actually, let's look um, at any one of these. Look at verse 30. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. He's referring to people that are going their own way. Their own way. Look at Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. These verses are a simple reminder to us that we were all born with a way. Okay? Isaiah chapter 56. We were all born with a way. <laughs> In Isaiah chapter 56, verse number nine, he says, all ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs that can't, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. Tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. They're living for the moment, they're living for the day, they're living for themselves. These shepherds, they just go out there. Have you ever hired somebody to do a job that just showed up to get paid, and they didn't care what you said or how you said it? They just showed up because they were going to do their thing for a certain amount of hours and just get the money and go home. You ever hired somebody like that? You ever hired them for long? No. I mean, my brother tells a story about somebody that he hired. I, I don't know. If, I don't think I've ever told him be you before, but I may have. He hired a young man and took him on the job. 
came back, and before long, people were asking my brother, hey, I want to work with you. I, I hear about all these good things that you do and all these things you give away. My brothers don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, we heard you gave him this. We heard you gave My brother's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't give him anything. Well, you gave him a, a brand new set of drills, DeWalt drills, and you gave, my brother's like, no, I don't. So he's like, went and talked to the guy, and he's like, hey, uh, about those drills I gave you. Huh? He said, you stole those from somebody else on the job site. And you're going to go return them. I did not give them to you, and you don't go tell them what I did, because I didn't. He said, my brother said, looking back, I knew where those drills came from, and I knew where they were setting, and it didn't dawn on me that while I've got this guy supposedly working for me, he's stealing from the other contractors on the sites. And he came back saying, Nate gave all this to me. And he's like, no, nope, you're taking them back, and you're not working for me anymore. You're coming to get whatever you want out of the job site and not getting everything done that you're supposed to do. And that's how people are living their lives. They have their own way. And we were all born that way. So the point of being contrary is, first of all, to realize that we were all born with a sin nature, all heading the same way. We were all headed for hell. We were all doing our own thing. That's the truth. Every one of us was living our own way. And you can go through the book of Judges um, where it talks um, twice in the book, I think chapter 4 and chapter 21, both times it says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I have a bad habit based on some Bible thoughts. And uh, I say it's a bad habit because I, I, people don't listen. And then when they do hear you, they take it wrong most of the times. And so sometimes people will be telling me, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And they're not giving you a chance to correct them and say, hey, you know, according to the Bible, I'd, you shouldn't do that. Here's the verses. They just tell you what they're going to do. And I have a bad habit. So I'm just letting you know, I don't even think I turn this thing on. I have a bad habit a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody and they just go on and on and on and on and on. Then I just say, you're right. Now, I'm using the right in the terms of the book of Judges and that's where my mind is. You're right in your own eyes. Now, they're probably thinking, oh, he thinks that's a good idea. No, but you're not giving me a chance to let you know what the Bible, you're not asking for advice, you're not asking for counsel, you're gonna do it anyway, so... If you ever hear me say that to you, you're right. I'm not saying that you're actually doing it in your own eyes, right? But I may. So feel free to ask me, are you using the book of Judges reference in that I'm right in my own eyes? Or are you saying I'm right according to the Bible? Because the Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We all have a way that we are going in life. Isaiah chapter 66 Isaiah chapter 66. And now I can tone my voice down a little bit. I forgot all I didn't even have that on. It's this this thing is really handy. And so you don't have to ruin your voice and tear it up. People have their own way. Should a Christian be contrary? Well, Isaiah chapter 66, verse number two, or verse one, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen, what? Their own ways. And their soul delighteth in their abominations. They're even sacrificing like God said, but they're doing it their own way. They're doing it for their own gratification, their own self-pleasure. They're not doing it for God. Now, here's where we, I'm going to go. A couple more passages. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Now, the word contrary is in the Bible quite a bit, okay? There's a chapter, um, I don't know that it, we even went to it, but there's a chapter that the word contrary is used quite a bit. But Luke chapter 10, so we know that everybody has a way. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end thereof are the ways of death. Every one of us has a way. We were born in that way. Luke chapter 10. 
Now, if you remember, Martha was serving. Mary was trying to listen to Jesus and Martha was complaining. Martha, and here's something I, I, I do seriously, strongly believe myself. Uh, it's something I've recommended. I've been in many churches. And I, I ladies, I'm saying this with caution because I appreciate you. I do greatly appreciate what you do. But I do not personally believe that we ought to have to have somebody getting the kitchen and dining room ready for dinners during an actual service or cleaning up the dining room or kitchen and area during a service. I believe there comes a time when we can, and, and I truly believe we can work together. And, and if we don't, we ought to be reprimanded or recommended, hey, would you guys mind helping clean up or set up or whatever? If we could do things before or after the service, as far as getting food ready or cleaning, cleaning up, because there's a biblical precedence that when the word of God is being spoken and shared, there ought to be a desire in the believers to be around it. And Martha was like, Jesus, you've got to tell my sister to get up. Mar Mary is sitting there listening to Jesus speak. And Martha's like, you need to get up and come help me in the kitchen. We've got guests to serve. We've got things to do. And Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10, verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You have your way of doing things, but you're so concerned about getting your things done that you're actually going contrary to the thing that is what? One thing is needful. You're actually going contrary to the one thing that you need to be doing is when Jesus was speaking, he's like, you need to be over here listening. This is one thing that's needful. That's where a lot of times we get so caught up in doing things our way that we forget about the things that are needful for the believer because the literal teaching here is, Martha, you're going contrary to what a believer ought to be doing in this very moment. Not that Martha didn't need to be serving and not that Mary shouldn't be helping her, but in the moment, they were going contrary to what a believer should be doing because a believer should be desiring the word of God. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. There's a verse number 27. And uh, I like to use this verse when I deal with someone who is of a Catholic background who wants to lift up Mary, okay? this If you deal with a Catholic who wants to say, we need to pray to Mary and worship Mary, take this passage, write it down, record it. Remember this one, Luke eleven twenty seven, 27. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Lifting up Mary. And Jesus says, verse 28, But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. He said, Anyone that hears God's word and keeps the word of God, they're blessed not just because somebody was able to feed me from birth to where I was able to eat meat, not because somebody was able to be my mother, but because you have the word of God and you keep it. That's blessed. The thing about the believer, look at Matthew. Two more passages, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. The problem with the word contrary is so many times we actually think that the word contrary is living in total opposition to everything the world is doing, and we should be opposed to that. But many times we have to remember that we as believers are living contrary to the actual way a believer should be living. And we don't even realize it many times because we get so caught up in religious things Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus was accused 
of doing things through the devil. Okay? Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Verse 30, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Jesus is very clear. You're either with me or you're contrary to me. You're actually against me. There's a lot of people that believe, well, no, I'm like that lukewarm church. I'm not really doing anything for God, but I'm not working against him. I'm sort of just in the middle riding the fence. It sounds good, except Jesus Christ himself says the opposite. If you're not with me, you're against me. You're going contrary to me personally. That's what he says. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. So the life of a believer ought to be lived in such a way that we are living not contrary to the working of God, not contrary to the ways of God, but the contrary way that we are living is contrary to the way that we were born, contrary to the sinful nature, contrary to our way, contrary to our own understanding, contrary to our own thinking. First Peter chapter 3. To the point where we could go to many verses on this one. Like in, in Matthew, I'm not going to go to it, but Matthew chapter 5 where he talks about, uh, or Matthew 6, love your enemies, um, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despise you. Um, over and over and over, there is a natural way that we were born. For instance, there's a group out there that right now is doing parades all over the country. Okay? Their whole focus is love, they're saying. And I'm not going to get into a lot of de details, but their whole focus is love. Okay? In love, they're sending death threats to people that don't believe their way. Even if people are not opposing them, they send death threats. Why? Because it's still natural to them. It's, their, it's the sin nature, it's the human nature. So even though they claim that their lifestyle is a lifestyle of love, scripturally speaking, they cannot be living their life in love if they don't know Christ. And so therefore, there's going to be the tendencies to violence, to hatred, to causing problems. Um, the Bible talks about revelings. The world loves that term, the revelers, the revelers, the revelers. The scriptures are very clear that reveling in the Bible is wrong. Getting together and having a, a birthday party or having a, a wonderful time with friends like that is not wrong. But reveling goes to a different extent. You don't even have a purpose. There's, there's wickedness involved. There's things... Here's where we ought to live contrary. Okay, I'm going to finish with this. We were born with a way. Every one of us, the way of sin. Every one of us was born a sinner on our way to hell, following the will and ways of the devil. When we became a believer, our lifestyle ought to be contrary to this way and that we don't even actually use the weapons of this warfare, we don't use violence and hatred and, and anger like the world uses it. We ought to, here we are, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. Finally, 
Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. I'm not done yet. We have, I'm going to mention something else that's current. I'm not preaching politics, but we have a border patrol that has holding cells and places for illegal immigrants. Do you know what's going on down at the border? We are, we have politicians, we have preachers, we have all kinds of people fighting each other for political reasons at the border, making up all kinds of stories and lies and just back and forth. They're lying, they're lying, and, and their videos, they got videos, they got pictures, and it's all kinds of nonsense. The Bible tells us to pity, the Bible tells us to love, the Bible tells us to be courteous, and then it says this, verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. We are not called as believers to go into this world as a con in a contrary manner to fight them. We are called to go into this world and use a different weapon of warfare, the love of Christ, the truth of the word of God, not doing it our way. Because, you know what, does anyone know what my way is? My way is this way over here. When I was born in sin, this is my way. And if I do anything with the tools that I was born with as a sinner, I'm doing it my way. But contrary would be living a godly life in such a manner, not only am I living contrary to the way that I was born, but now I'm a believer, so I'm, if I'm living God's way, I'm also living contrary to those that are doing things that way by when they attack, they say things, I show the love of Christ, which I'm not retaliating with their weapons of anger and just hollering back and so should we not railing for rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but what contrary wise, we ought to be wise in our contrary ways. We ought to use the wisdom of the scriptures, living contrary, opposing the world's ways through the wisdom of Christ, through the love of Christ. We ought to live in opposition, but it's not in bombing clinics. It's not in starting wars. It's not in killing people. I do believe we ought to allow the government to do what the government's supposed to do. But we as individual believers should live contrary to the flesh that we were born with, live contrary to the world. We ought to be contrary people. So when our neighbor walks across our front yard and we don't want to walk in through our yard, we go out there and offer him a glass of water. Hey, I saw you were walking by. I thought you might be hot. Went, huh? I ain't going to that guy's yard again. <laughs> you gotta keep offering me water. We ought to live so contrary to the world and the ways of the world that people notice a difference. They're different. They don't fight back with our weapons of warfare. No. No. We have different weapons spiritual weapons. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we leave here tonight, Lord, may we learn how to, how to war in a contrary manner, how to live in a contrary, in an opposition, in an opposing manner, so that when the enemy comes up and they realize that even in our opposition, that there is somebody more powerful than us and them and then they find out it's because of the scriptures that we're trying to live by and the God of the Bible that loves them and wants to save them as well. And may we win another one to you. I thank you for the word of God. And I pray that you would help us to not go into this world and just try to be opposing anything and everybody based on our own ways. Not picking fights with people needlessly, 
not starting things that don't need to be started, but loving people so that we can show them the love of Christ and the truth of God's word so that if there is something that is wrong, we can show them from the Bible that the Bible says it's wrong. Not for us to just hide that fact either. Thank you for your love, your kindness, your watch care over us. I ask you to bless in the name of Jesus Christ. And thank you. I will say this as I close, Lord, thank you for the freedoms that we have as Americans. Help us to continue to have those freedoms so that we can share the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.